So welcome to Rise Up and Carve. Um, my name is Kate and um, our current spoon challenge is a, not a spoon, it's a cup. So um, we got John to come and show us how he makes his cups. He's been making kajillions of cups. <laughs> so he's going to help us uh, figure out how to do this template. And obviously there are a million ways to carve a cup, but um, this is just kind of an entryway in. Um, John kind of figured out all the, some of the, you know, easier way to do things, but obviously you can use the tools you have at home. So um, anyway, I will pass it over to John. John all right, cool, take it away. Great. Cups on this one are going to be quite small ones, so it's not as much hollowing out because obviously the more neat you hollow, the worse it gets. And they are about two inches deep and about roughly two inches, maybe two and a half inches deep and two inches in diameter. And end grain is possibly quite quite easier to hollow out. So what I do is here's your chunk of wood. And I've done it in just black so it's easy to see. Just, and it's all in grain. It's probably larger than you need at the moment. And okay. the first way, what you would do is draw a hole in the middle. And generally, I've been using just a first a bit. So I'll get out first. And and then he won't be using that because I go to the big one, I think it's stuck. <laughs> of course. <laughs> that. I've got a new rubber pad on, and I think it's probably glued. Yeah, just bash it. Yeah. <laughs> Hammer, the universal tool. Yeah. I'll do that after. I can do it with that. And yeah. I just super glued a bit on. High torque bit. And usually I brace it my chest for this drill just so that it's not going to take your hand away and then Now, is that the new Nick Westerman power gouge? That again? <laughs> I can, I could have done it with one hand shot, but life's too short. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. That, that took all of about a minute. Yep. I usually do it to the date. This bit is almost the right date. Because it's the foster bit. With a wee tiny hole, it just yep. leaves that. So it's quite easy to get rid of that in the bottom. Yep. So. There we go. Then, you know, it's only about acting, so it's generally want to try and reduce that. It's just a matter of then. This one's actually quite a lot taller. It only goes to about that height. So it's probably a couple inches spare just to happen to be a bit of wood. But it also gives you something else to hold on to. 
いいな。あれでのでトライショップライトのトップ、unless you use a little bump cut, でのトップ、ポイントで、ショップ、ポイントで、ポイントで、ポイントで、ポイントで、ポイントで、ポイントで、ポイントで、ポイントで、ポイントで、ポイントで、ポイントで、ポイントで、ポイントで、ポイントで、ポイントで、ポイントで、ポイントで、ポイントで、ポイントで、ポイントで、ポイントで、ポイントで、ポイントで、ポイントで、ポイントで、ポイントで、ポイントで、ポイントで、ポイントで、ポイントで、ポイントで、ポイントで、ポイントで、ポイントで、ポイントで、ポイントで、ポイントで、ポイントで、ポイントで、ポイントで、Don't need as much handle there, so you can probably just cut that off too. Well, you've got the bell, it's a、uh, I think that is about 18 millimeters or quarters of an inch or so. Yep. So、we'll、just rest the edge of the block and go into the main part of the cup. Just Somebody was just asking in the、uh, chat if you mentioned the kind of wood you're using. Right. It's just it's cherry. Cherry? An ornamental, an ornamental cherry. Basically, get it to very roughed out like that. Then the whole went out. I don't know. It looks pretty done. All you have to do now is add liquid and drink. <laughs> yep,、yeah, I would say so. If you don't take long to do, then. <laughs> Up a little bit. Generally, how I'm hauling them a bit like shrink pots. Just, just straight knife.、Oh. You're still above your camera. You might want to bring your camera up a bit more. Right. Okay. How's that? Yep, just、better. straight knife. That goes quite quickly. Yeah, because it's end grain, if it's side grain, obviously you need to change direction、yeah. to pull it out a little bit. So I'll just get my feet in for a second. Yeah, this is the part that's just like a shrink pot. Yeah. yeah. But we'll do the end grain. You're not long, pull it out.
that's, you get the idea of that. So it's already down to that diameter. And then, depends what tools you've got. If it's taller, easier making it more tapered all the way through. Taper this one right out to make it slightly wider here to start with. Generally, I'll be using a loop sort. So because you've got there, that goes right where you basically can get right to the bottom and it clears a little dot. Your waist, just do it exactly the same way. The only bit that takes a little bit of time is getting the last bit of end grain at the bottom. Uh, just to, there's nothing much you can do, just persevere, take little chunks out. There's different more of hoop knives, they seem to be better, or even the Robin Wood compound curve. It goes into yeah. not too bad either. But whatever you've got, ending with gouges, four neck ones, or Anything at all, just to remove the wood near the base. So far off at that one already. But here's, as I said here, here's one I've done earlier. Is it a magic swap out? <laughs> magic swap out. Look, oh, look, I've got the bottom <laughs> cleared. <laughs> yeah. That one probably took. I would say from where I started there to get it as wide as that, maybe about an hour. So, and it was right down, got right to the bottom, and it'll, it'll roughly carve the rest of it. And the rest is just the same. You go back with the axe. Now, how how thick are you aiming to leave your uh, body and your would, side walls? The side walls, usually as thin as you can be brave enough. I would say they are... Can you see that? That's a two millimeters at the top, maybe slightly thicker as it goes down. Yep. I don't know what that is. Just about an eighth of an inch, would that be? But... And then how thick on the bottom? Uh, probably about one. I'll tell you, I'll get a measure here. Yeah, That is two and a half millimeters for that one. And I'll need to do the base by fraction. And I'll say the base is less than 10 millimeters or three eighths of an inch. Okay. Because it's end grain, you want to leave a little bit there. Because it's obviously yeah. most porous at the bottom. Of yep. the one of them I've gone a little bit, still think that was only about two or three millimeters. Uh, just because I was getting a bit over ambitious. Back to your axe, I haven't done the hand on that one yet. But I mean, usually stick your thumb in the middle of it to keep it out of harm's way. You know, the more you go off with the axe, the less work you've got to do by knife. Probably get it down to because already I've used the knife at the top of this one to give me a wee band to get roughly the thickness I want. Yeah. And, you know, don't bother above that with your, your axe. If you, that makes sense. Do you have something to chop to? Yeah, to register off of. Yeah. yeah. You do, do just, but it's only down about less than a quarter of an inch, so it's easy uh, not to go above that. 
and this is just an old, it's a, a Bajo axe that I modified, and it's got quite good sharp corners. Yeah. It's, it's, it's in the handles, it's not, it's not an expensive thing, it cost me £11 pounds in steel, with just a bit of sharpening. It's a, it works far better for this than my transverse carbon axe. So. <laughs> Yeah, 150 quid rather than 11, so it doesn't need to be fancy. And if it's sharp enough, it should be able to just slice, don't chop the edge away. Yep. Slice up to your a uh, knife mark. Or do it that way around. So usually angle the axe slightly out the way. Just three taps. At this point you're only removing little tiny bits of wood because they're almost the right thickness. Mm -hmm. yeah. The then so that's your basic cut sort of rough style. Usually, at that I start with a knife. Nice. Oh, is it in green again? I can't, I can't, I can't believe how fast this is going. We're like 15 right? minutes in. Yeah. Yeah. Right, because it's this a uh, green it happens a bit squirrely, goes all over the place. But generally, I can raise my knife where I've done before and just keep on pulling down with basically a potato peel or cut and work your way. All the way down. If you can mark a little line in the bottom or a circle to where you just give you a guide, and just mm. or other way is just to... This is the part of the carving process for me. I've carved some cups and some cookses, and but I don't do them regularly. This is the part where you are using that potato peeler cut on that long side grain, and you feel like you're never gonna you. You feel like, oh my God, this is going to take me a thousand years and a million cuts. What? And and then and then after you know, after a little while, you kind of get a feel for it, and you figure out how to do it, and the cuts get bigger, and the the the, the handholds get easier. But this is where carving cups feels really hopeless at this stage. Yeah. Well, I've just noticed I'm quite a wee bulge on that. It doesn't taper down the way. So say I'm messing about with a knife. Back to that again. I usually well, tend to start with the with the outside, get it kind of cleaned up, and then try to clean up the inside to the outside. That's just dumb. This is way this is a way faster way to do it. And the yeah, fact that he's ta the, that taper right, it's wider at the top, tapering down into the bottom. That's why yeah. these that's why these axe cuts will come out clean instead of tearing out a big. Um, if you're doing a spoon, generally, well, I generally haul out the bowl and then get the back to follow the bowl. So it's, I've just gone for the same, get, get it uh, roughly the size you need. And it's still, you can still take some more off the inside afterwards. They're still, this is still quite thick. But they're also quite wet, these logs. They were cut last spring in a power line where they've been lying since, but they're still really wet. So they're almost coming up to a year old. It's been left in big chunks under the, some other trees. Yeah, you can really get a lot done with the axe. 
yeah, with this one, because it's got a nice uh, heel on it, you can go the opposite way and just pump it right in towards your handle. Get right in there tight. John, in, in that in that spot where you are now, yep. when, when you first split that wood away, had you already sawn in a right. stop cut along I'm there? Sure you, one I did somewhere. Yes, I have. That's the one I started with uh, earlier on. It's all I had to, I had it clamped in that vise of glued shut. Uh, you just see the remains of the saw mark there. Okay. Yeah. All right, thank you. Bring your circle then, do saw cut. And it's not the same thing, it's not a fancy saw, it's just a general uh, the panel saw. And right. one, just, you don't need anything too fancy, just a nice sharp saw. And then your wood comes away uh, quite easily. Feels like with that handle, you could also stick that in your spoon meal pretty pretty nicely and oh. be able to oh thanks so then do a draw knife you could get off the yeah. get further than there but certainly you'll get all there and it's, at this point it's still quite thick so you could stick it into a mule to... hmm. you always use the going through the or is it just to... Say that again? Can you repeat that? Question? Yes. I was asking if, if you always go through the end grain or if you just did the end grain on this case for speed or if there's an advantage to that. The advantage is you can use off cuts because all the stuff I use is basically firewood. They have got, you think there's a, a side grain one, you need quite a longer bit of log up and down that way. Whereas these bits, they're just a, I think you can sort of triangle to start with just a tiny wee bit of wood and it's just fitted on no more. Whereas that way, you need a longer piece of wood to start with. But it's just basically, and do name these side grain ones is fine, but when you come to here, you've got to change a grain. There's already to use a scorp or I generally use a left and a right handed uh, hook knife to do them out because obviously the grain changes direction as you come round. Yeah, was, just like the bowl of a spoon. Yeah. 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 But I think of it less failures when grain cups than I have had with cross grain cups. Mm. This is a lot. I, think, I don't remember if I've been touched wood. I don't think I've had a, a, an end grain cup split on me. Whereas I've had loads of side grain ones split. Okay, Sorry. so a higher split rate with the side grain? Yeah, there's, I would say about 30% split with side grain. And so far, I haven't had any end grain split on me. Don't about the rest and just cutting down. There's one that's all that is finished now is basically carry on with your first one, get comfy. The other um, thing that I've heard is with end grain cups, it's probably a good idea to try and stay away from the center, right? Where it, that the the rings are tighter, it's, it's better to try to, you know, get a get your get a quartered piece that you've stayed away from where the pith in the center of the log is, you know, because you have more of a risk. Yeah, they, and they wore some of these. It was just we sell the off cuts, so they do. I actually tell about see the bigger ones maybe you see better. You can maybe can't see in camera, but it's not you know, it doesn't show up, but it is actually slightly off round now, whereas that was round as it dried. Yeah. It's slightly yeah. off center. Is it because it's green so weird with that cherry, it does all sorts of funny things. That one 
Whereas that one goes completely over. That is a side grain one. Yeah. Okay, so it's yeah. just the way it's shrunk. I've got some um, really nicely shaped ones now, Chuck. <laughs> They're certainly not circles anymore. <laughs> right. No, they... It, but that's what makes them special, man. You know? <laughs> yeah, you've been carving these now too, Jackie, right? Yeah, I'm having a load of fun with them, actually. I've, I've just had to stop this week and do some spoons, and I'm, like, itching to get back and learn some more cups. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, watching him carve these, it's like if somebody wanted to be a production carver, I would think cups are actually more efficient. I think. Yeah. Well, you saw how long that one was. I started from start. I mean, I need to cut the base of it. But give me a little bit longer, and then I, that one would be finished. And give me another hour, maybe that would be completely done. And then enough right. to leave it to dry. Uh, to finish it off because this is probably weighs almost a pound because it's really uh, saturated. Yeah. But these, right, even this little one that's been set, that, that was in a bag, that weighs virtually nothing. And the one that has been completely finished, so it's, it's better like. Yeah. But that's your cup done. And what I've been treating them with is originally, I used to use. Uh, that, which is fine, it tamps your seam stuff, it's okay, but it's a bit like wind sealed oil, it tastes, must use it for quite a few uses. So then it was wooden tall when we uh, always cupped up the highlands, got me onto this hard wax oil, three takes hard wax oil, and it's, it's much the same as a mixture of beeswax and other drying oils. And it's food safe as well. And you pop a coat of that inside. And it comes up like it's got quite a sheen to it. No. It completely seals the end grain. And also seems to stop them cracking quite a lot. So, and does it uh, does it hold up for hot use? Yep, they've all been I haven't tested them, but the one I use uh, for at work every day is basically something similar to that. What did we say? What did we say was the U.S. equivalent? What was it? Some of the Osmo oils, I think you can get. Osmo, yeah, okay. But it's, I think it's this hard wax and, and food safe was your. There's a. I read the stuff on this, and they had all sorts of a. Uh, the taste for the, you know it doesn't leach out. They had it in boiling water, so it wouldn't leach. They had it in such and such, and all the taste came back. Aye, it's food safe. Plus. What's in it that's the other than some? If you leave it to a uh, dry out a little bit or get cold, it gets a wee line of beeswax on the, the top of it, so you need to keep it warm. Obviously, got quite a lot of beeswax in. So, um, how what what's your drying um, process, right. John, before you oil it? These when we started this, when we just were through the discussion to do it, spent that a couple of weeks ago. Uh, just after the last chat, I started them then, and that's these four dry. So they've been done and dried. A uh, well, that be from that first one. I was drying it slowly for about a week in a bag full of chips, and then okay. this was still in. It's like really wet, but probably now it's been in the bag for a week like that. Mm -hmm. I'll probably leave it out now to finish drying it and then do the final cuts because this cherry's up. Uh, kind of hard when you do cuts on it it gets a nice polished finish as you go and then just they've been just burnished with stone and then coat the oil yeah and i guess it depends on the humidity in the place where you live too mm. they're just sitting in a certain heated well it's in a conservatory which has got a radiator in it so it gets to probably 19 degrees uh, during the day when the sun or the heat's on it uh, which mm -hmm. is what just about 60 Fahrenheit, but they're, they are in a, a bag full of chips to slow them down. Do you do but, more than one coat of finish? Uh, yes, because basically, uh, give it a good coat first of all, and the same as usual, wipe it out, wipe it away, and uh, let it set. Then leave them 
I usually, after I've cooked, I'll stick them above the fireplace eh, on a hearth and they coat them again. But the second coat takes virtually nothing. You're virtually just wiping your fingers on it and it like, yeah. dip, dip your finger in and rub it around and that's enough to coat it the second time. And then try it with warm water after a week. If it's not sealed, give it another coat. Yeah. So they, use, they use that in the outside as well. At the, the, this side's not too, like, it's not too bothered because it's quite difficult for the liquid to come through that, but we want to make sure there's quite a few coats on the, the base where the end grain will just like, weep right through what a straw. Right. That's what I was curious about. But um, no, a couple, couple of coats, and then if not, just but don't leave that, certainly that stuff, you don't leave it to set because it will kind of set not quite well varnish, but you'll get a thick layer, which then takes forever to dry. Yeah. Yeah, better to do multiple thin layers yeah. to dry quickly. That's what I've always when heard. You, when you get to yeah. this size, I don't haul out like I don't haul them out with a knife. I finish with my knife, you can see I don't even see the base. Got a, a dovetail on it and it goes into my lathe. It's just exactly the same process. Drill a hole through the middle and then haul it out with just a a, a chisel. Uh, because if not, that would take you you'd, you'd lose interest long before you ever finished calling out the inside. Yeah, so the bigger ones you use a chisel. Do yeah. you carve a little hollow in the bottom of the each cup or how do you? Yeah, there's stop the rocking and usually just Oh, that one I've already done it in. Yeah, go over that. And it's just, it's probably, oh, hardly, not even a millimetre. So there's a ring round the outside. Yeah. When it sticks, you won't stick up on that log anyway. But if not, sometimes when it dries, you get a wee hump. So you're almost just, but it's just very barely. Uh, you can see the, the marks of the. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you can it's see. It's pulled out the middle bit. That's polished a bit more because it's been. So there was a, a comment in here that uh, Rob saying, I saw somewhere online a comment about boiling a cooksa in salt water. What is the rationale for doing something like that? I'm assuming the rationale is that the salt somehow helps draw moisture out of the cup. But I know there's another guy, uh, Wooden Tom, on Instagram uh, and on YouTube who has a video where he went and he tested a bunch of these myths about you know, uh, drying wooden cups and, and how, you know, how to prevent cracking and all of that. And that is one that he specifically tested and he said it it, it made no difference whatsoever. No, it's, and I think it was a Toby tried his one that he had been previously used for coffee, yogurt on it to seal it and left it overnight and it cracked. He thinks the moisture from the yogurt uh, expanded the, his cup at a different rate and it ended up splitting on him. Uh -huh. so, but I've tried different bits. I've tried yogurt uh, and different bits for the uh, casium to seal out the pores and it still leaked. Okay, okay. yeah. Yeah, because that was the other one. People say milk yeah. or yogurt. Yeah. yeah. I was yeah. wondering, has anybody here tried uh, Jared Dahl has a product from Japan that he sells. It's quite expensive, but Hasui Ceramic, and it's supposed to have a very, uh, like natural feel. It leaves the you don't. It doesn't look like it's got like a glossy, shiny, you know, plasticky finish. It's got a very natural looking finish, but it supposedly forms a glass like seal. Um, I'm just curious. Has anybody here ever tried it? I have one of Jared's cups that has has that uh, finish on it, and yeah, it's it's very water tight, waterproof. There's no taste. Um, uh, I have some of the ceramic. You need to use like a really thin layer. It's kind of like when you yeah. oil something too. You just have yeah. to do layers, thin layers. Um, but. Yeah. It was quite expensive, so I was curious for something like, especially I wouldn't I wouldn't even necessarily think you would need it on the sides, but for the bottom for that end grain, if you're doing an end grain cup, I would think it would be advantageous. But I wasn't sure if it would soak up so much of it that it would be economically impractical. But yeah, when you say it's how expensive, it's very you know quite expensive. 
I I think it's like 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 a small the smallest sample size he has. I forget. It's just a few ounces, but it's like thirty bucks or something like that. Right. And I know like a larger size, like a quart size or something like that, is like a hundred and something dollars. Yeah. Yeah. I think he imports some from Japan. Exactly. Yeah. I'm not saying it's the value isn't there. I'm no, just, no, just right, right, right. Well, what what a time I'll use this on the outside because this is half the price of what this stuff is. Yeah. Like this stuff is roughly, what was that? 20, 20, I think that's 20 something pounds for half a, well, probably what's called a pint. And that's roughly 10, 10 pounds a pint. So it's, okay. So basically, the stuff that you taste, I'll give yeah. it the, the cheap stuff on the outside because it's a, and what I do with that one, it, so you don't waste it because it's quite expensive compared to the other one. Is I put it into over here with a little single use jam pot. Yeah. The whole probably a couple of hours. Like once a while, I know we still use a decant into that, and they'll last. But well, because there's only that amount in it, they'll they'll do one of these wee jars. will do probably four or five cups. Which is so Yeah. You don't need your end because if not, if you leave the tin open and don't use it, it ends up. Uh, you got a skin on it and it wastes it. You can't keep the hair out of it. But, and are you are you wiping that on? You said were you wiping it on with your fingers inside just, or just my well, just my fingers. Yeah. So, okay. So just uh, yeah, put it into just dip my fingers. Put them in the jar. Dip them in. Sometimes the very first one I'll pour a uh, just put a blob in the middle and then use that obviously to yeah just go around the whole cup. And the only thing I would say about that is quite sticky. So usually what I do is you clean your hands is get some uh, like vegetable oil. We like a little bit of vegetable oil on your hands, clean them with vegetable oil and then wash them because it doesn't wash off properly in soap and water. And it does tell you don't do that, but it's not bothered me so far. Because the usual exposed you know, exposure, too much exposure will lead to dry skin or things. Because it feels... So far, yeah. it hasn't happened. Yeah. Wear gloves if you're sensitive to some of the stuff that's in it. But it's easier than using a brush, I think. Plus, the heat of your hands help push it in. But basically, that's it. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. It goes. There you go. That was probably about the, just almost the size of a template. Uh, Thing. It's very slightly bigger, so template. Yeah. But it's more like that size. And it gives you either, it's probably, a, I would, that'd be maybe a, if you're really needing caffeine, it's like a treble espresso, I would say that it's old. <laughs> or a small, <laughs> or, a, or equivalent to a cup of coffee, probably, I would say that one is. And that was like a normal standard, like mug. And then, you get bigger, goes to whatever that is. And then you get silly and you make them, it's like... That's your beer cup. Yeah, that would probably hold almost a pint. It's a big handle of one, so it's not nice. small, but the size of that. So you just... But yeah, they're all but the same profile, just obviously bigger. You can't get the cameras that big. Just the same profile. Cut them out all exactly the same way. Cut down the bits then. Axe them all out and uh, a nice size scotch drink. cup. <laughs> if you drunk that in one night, there'll be you wouldn't remember those things. <laughs> it won't go anyway. But interestingly, I think he double seal them when you're using whiskey in them because it seems to seep through the end grain a lot easier than virtually any other liquid. So. John, do you have, how careful are you with the handle? Have you had them snap off? Uh, no, I haven't had them snap off because even though they're, you leave them, what's that? They're over a quarter of an inch thick. So I leave them quite thick that way. You can thin them down quite a bit going the other way. Uh, and uh, cross grain ones, then, yeah, you can make them probably thinner. Although that would happen to be chunkier. But, I've dropped them two or three times, and so far they've broken. Uh, they seem once they dry, they're quite tough. But obviously, yeah. if you make a big long handle, with the grain running up and down the way, if you 
you could probably do that and break it. Keep that yeah. why they're, they're quite short. But they're still big enough that I mean, I've got big fat fingers. And with 18, once you open up that 18 millimeter hole just and round it off, my fingers fit in there. And that one, oh, you drilled a second hole at the bottom. So your finger fits in there and the size of the cup. And the wee tiny ones, uh, they're light enough. Your finger does actually fit in them, but you can hold them without putting your finger in, but my finger does fit in them too. Mm -hmm. Make sure so you that, put your pinky up. Yeah, but make sure your finger fits in so you can hold them. But they're that light, you can pinch them with a, a push teacup. <laughs> yeah. There's not much in them. Plus, you'll be drinking the, if it's the espresso, you'll be drinking that quick anyway. It won't last long. I think that's all there is to tell you all. There's, hopefully, we'll see some more coming up. Yeah. Anybody have other questions? Has anybody ever seen anybody charring the inside? I, I saw it. Well, I have charred one, and it's, I was going to get it just now, but it's in the sitting room on the mantelpiece. I had to recarve it because it cracked in inside. The heat cracked it. Yeah. So I think you need to be very gentle with it. It's got just heat cracks. It's still waterproof, but because it's charred, I've carved them out and out and out, and it's still all the places with little black lines on it now. Uh, which they look like cracks, but they're not. Well, probably are, but they're microscopic, but they're, they're sealed, but they look weak. But mm -hmm. you need to be very careful. If not, when you heat the wood, it cracks. It can crack quite easily, especially when it's completely dry. Yeah. I just wanted to say that our um, show and tell for this, we've given a little extra time. So um, the show and tell is on March 2nd. So if you if you carve a cup and you want to come and show how how it went, come on March second. Um, uh, there was another question. Can you show what you did to the bottom on the outside? No, it's just so you just hollow it slightly to make it a little hollow it slightly. Yeah. yeah, just we're all done. It's you, you can if you get them flat. Once you're drying, you can actually carve them. I mean, they're, they're not hollows. I've just carved them because it's a sharp knife because it's angry and you can carve them quite well. But I tried that one just in case. And it's just, if not, to finish the bottom, to even out a little bit. You can take your hook knife and. Yeah, you can, or just go with that way, I think, like, go round and round and round. Just, and look at it to make sure they're not skewed. They're just I'm curious. Up. Have you tried doing one with a reverse taper where it's wider at the base and narrower at the top? I have a note. <laughs> you probably could, but it'd be slightly hard to hollow. Yeah. Mm. It's like a sailor's cup, you mean? With a, a wide yeah, because you, yeah, you'd have to undercut it a little bit. Yeah, just to make it uh, a little more stable. You probably could do it. Or it's, it's more just an aesthetic thing. It looks nicer if they're done that way around but yeah it's probably good but i know what you want to mean whether that way uh, yeah in a way you could leave it with me i'll try one yeah see what happens but it's just a bit more hassle to hollow it because uh you're going yeah, you're, like, you're undercutting it yeah. you're undercutting it. that way is natural to do it and it's i think it's quite it's quite different to uh Move the edge right at the base if you've undercut it too much. Yeah. Okay. I think it's probably more about a nice hollow bottom because that hook possibly gets yeah. into the Robin Wood compound. Yeah. Uh, we'll get in. Yeah. But I haven't tried it, but feel free to try it, Chuck. Yeah, I might give it a go. I'm, uh, I'm kind of tempted. I'm um I'm thinking about my I don't have it handy but the the Nick Westerman finishing hook has it comes all the way over yep. so I'm thinking I might be able to get it with that and I left a long handle on that one so but probably basically it's like whatever hook you've got uh, make the size to fit if you can't get you've not got one with a, a bit at the bottom do it make them slightly uh, wider and more rounded. Uh, and tapered as much. Yeah. Hey, I 
came in a little late. It's Dave. Um, what size was the force in the bit you're using to drill the hole down the middle to start with? Right. Oh, well, worn off. Is... You look bigger That's... than any. 35 millimeter. 35 mil. Okay, it's quite yeah. big. Yeah. Yeah, because it's you can use little ones, but obviously the smaller they are, the more you have to hold out. So you may as well give yeah, it a sure. start. But whatever size you've got, and it was, uh, I think the ones I used to use were a hand drill, but it's quite aggressive, and that's the only way is to use something like that. And yeah. You use clips, but what you need to do with them is then use a smaller force in a bit in the end, because don't that tip there is a nightmare to dig out that. Yeah, yeah, you get that that spiky hole down the middle. Yeah, yeah. use a force well, that's probably that's eighteen mil bit, or even any size at all. A ten mil Forstner bit would do, and then to get you the base, then not so much to try and haul out. But yeah. that's what I used to use for them. Because also Forstner bits, it seems to be these sort of sharp tooth ones. Yeah, standard, standard like a uh, don't want to say cheap, but standard flat hinge drilling bits don't seem to work the same. I think I've got one here. That kind don't seem they, they don't seem as easy. Yeah, they're not going to go in. Yeah, not the end going grain. to the end grain so well, are they? No, they're fine for a cross grain. They're no absolutely no problem. Yeah. But don't but these sharks. I think you call them sharks. They fight yeah. into the, the end grain without any bother. And they're resharpenable too. So long, especially for sharks, they'll just bite in. But these kind. A help a cross because once that bites in, uh, that's why I've got a handle on that drill. Once it bites, it can be pretty violent. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, don't need, we don't want broken wrists. Yeah, that's, that, that's what I call it. It's a, I call it a wrist breaker. You need to yeah. pump it uh, and then uh, something like that with a handle on it. So you can, but usually I brace, brace that against my chest and two hands on the drill so it's completely solid. But yeah. you can use a normal brace and that and take your time. You can listen to that. That unused is all full of dust. <laughs> and, but yeah, they work just the same. But use whatever you've got, even a 10 mil uh, just normal drill bit and a hand drill, in has all to carve into it. A normal steel bit will cut into the wood. But you do give yourself more work. Uh, Pulling out there, but as long as you get a hole, it's just end grain. So you did for you how quick it was just to uh, pull that rub. Uh, back to the original one, it's yeah. We're talking about like good woods would be cherry. Right. Birch, maybe. I've, I've actually done them with ash as well. I made a, a pint mug with ash, and it didn't. It didn't leak, and it's. I've still got it. it was, uh, so that's but yeah. Sycamore, I used to use all the time, but sycamore seems to be quite brittle and splitty. You can get away with it, but like British sycamore, don't want you. Call sycamore over in the US just because there's loads of it, but it seems to be quite brittle. That can be temperamental. Mm. Birch is certainly a lot easier to carve, and if you get nice cherry, it's like the best cherry I've got. I like the green in it, but it can be a bit squirrely and a bit of a nightmare to do to change the direction. It's an old ornamental cherry that was 70 years old, but it's been trimmed and trimmed and trimmed over the years. Has anyone carved oak? I have. <laughs> yeah, oak's fine too, but it's also a bit harder. Harder. You need to watch your, you need to watch your tools with the tannin and especially these carbon steel ones. The tannin, you need to clean your knives when you're finished because tannin rush your blades. Yeah. Yeah, Rob was saying oak, poplar, and then. I know. I, I took a class at the spoon hoolie with Werner Fuchs, the virtual spoon hoolie a few years ago. And uh he, I know he recommended poplar as as very yeah. good for, for copper. Yeah. 
and yeah. easy to carve. Quite soft. Yeah. yeah. I'm doing alder just now, and that's really easy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. How's how is it with the leaking with alder, Ian? Well, my main drinking cup is alder, and it's okay. fine. Yeah. It's just nice and soft to carve. Yeah. yeah. We have so much red much. alder. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't move probably, that much either. Yeah, probably even a so semi mature willow would be quite easy to carve. Just yeah. not too fresh. So whatever's basically try it, if you do this the first time, don't pack something really hard or you will you'll regret it. <laughs> Peach I wouldn't recommend for one, although I have done them, but it's uh, regarding oak, I know somebody uh, Jay posted that you know you'd risk leaking with it. I have actually a cooksa, um, wasn't end grain, you know, it was side grain carved uh, that was an oak cooksa done by Roy Roki uh, here in the U.S. And he had used he has some sort of a clay or a silt like substance that he actually used to fill the pores in the oak, and then did his finish on top of that, and it's great. It All works. Right. It's really well. I've asked, I've talked to Roy extensively about his cups because he gets away with a lot of woods that leak. Yeah. And he also he also feels really strongly that the tongue oil he uses is responsible for his cups not leaking. So the the silt the silt like you said, and then the tongue the polymerizing tongue oil. Yeah. On top of the silt. Yeah. Yeah. And last CD1 is really wood steel and then inside is a little bit of uh, only on the outside of CA glue oh, on, the, on the outside. Don't put it on the inside because I don't think I, I wouldn't know what will happen with it when you've got hot light within it. But at least if it's if you last resort is I've done that in the whiskey cups on the outside because you won't won't seal. And uh, I'll just cut the oil off it and uh, just one one layer of CA glue. Hmm. And that, it seals it enough. That time it fills up with impurities inside and blocks up the pores. But that's enough to stop it. But I would recommend you put that in the inside. Yeah. Mm. It's also useful if you're constantly losing your cup. <laughs> you just blow it down. <laughs> Does anyone have any more questions? Or comments or experience. <laughs> That's really good. Um, thanks, John, for the demo. I, I have to run, folks. Thank you. No problem. Really good. Thanks. Yeah. Looking forward to a few cups. <laughs> nice. Looking forward to seeing them all. Hopefully, all they'll, right. hopefully they'll all come out uncracked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think Kaylin has decided what we'll do is uh, on the show and tell you to pour hot water into them or coffee into them as a test. And wow. Right. Uh, yeah. People will be showing up. It'll be like people showing up to watch auto races waiting to see the crashes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You laugh and you cry, you know. You right? Just yeah. Yeah, only thing I would say when you hot water test them, don't go straight for boiling water straight off. Stick it to like a, you know what what you would normally put coffee in them. That's at a temperature of, I don't know eighty five degrees or so, or even start at fifty. Try that and then pop it out and then warm them up and then put because you never use boiling water for coffee anyway. And if you make tea in a teapot, the thing you pour it in your mug is never at hundred degrees. So, so I wouldn't put. Straight out the kettle and into them. You can if you want for the comedy factor, but I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, John. I um yeah. really appreciate we all appreciate it. And um hopefully you guys can try it. Hopefully people will try one and yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll yeah. go and go and stick my vice to get it back into use again. Yeah. <laughs> A few more <laughs> hammer blows. That's right. Yeah. Thanks, John. Yeah, thank, thank thanks, you, John. John. Thank I'm you, gonna John. stop the recording so you can stay on if you want and chit chat or whatever. But.